Boom! Welcome to Mind Pump. Did you know there's an exercise that you can do every single day to build muscle? Well, stay tuned and find out. Also, the guys talk about old wives' tales regarding health. Are they just BS or is there some truth in them? In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions like, how can I build muscle and strength without any equipment? Can I get too old to build muscle? And finally, how can I get stronger at the deadlift? Finally, do you have friends and family that are just getting into fitness and you're having a hard time communicating with them exactly what they need to do? Well, we've got your back. We have Mind Pump clips right here on YouTube. Go over there, subscribe, and share those short clips with your friends and family. All right, here comes the show. Try this for big, muscular, strong legs. Push the sled every single day. Ooh, I was just going to... Every day. I was just going to jump on the bandwagon with that. I saw yeah. Doug doing it yesterday, and uh, he said he felt great. Yep. And I know that's been like... You've like completely... Drop squats and deads right now, or what did you what did you replace it with? Not, so, um, so before I would incorporate, you know, very very variations of squats, either the belt squat or traditional squats, or I do lunges, um, deadlifts. I'll still throw in here and there, but pretty. I don't do them super super often these days. And what I did was I just said, you know, let me just see what happens if I push the sled every single day. Because really, if you think about it, when you're driving the sled. It works the entire leg, including the calves. Right. And this is where it came from. I noticed my calves were kind of growing a little bit. And I hadn't really changed my calf training at all. I'm like, what's going on? And then I said, oh, it's got to be the sled. Because when I pushed the sled, especially when I first started pushing the sled frequently, I would notice my feet and my calves would kind of start to get fatigued. And so one of the side effects was my calves and my feet started feeling really strong. I said, let me, let me keep doing this and see what happens. And my legs... Are, are developing well and I have no pain, no aches and pains. My body, my joints feel really good. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because, actually I'm pretty sure it's because of one of the quote unquote weaknesses of driving the sled is actually one of its strengths. Because it, it eliminates the eccentric motion, right? Yeah. So you don't have any of the eccentric portion of the exercise. Yeah. So when you do it for people who don't understand what Adam's talking about, when you do a rep, you know, you have the concentric portion of the rep, right? Which is where you're lifting the weight. So that's a, a positive part of the rep. Then you have the pause, which would be isometric. And then you have the lowering part, which is the eccentric or the negative. And studies will show that the eccentric is most responsible. They're all responsible for muscle growth and strength, but the eccentric builds more muscle, causes more muscle damage, causes more soreness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are like, well, you needs know, more recovery. Yeah. Pushing the sled then isn't going to be a great muscle builder because it doesn't have the eccentric, it's all positive, right? It's all it's all concentric uh, contractions. However, which is true, so I think on a rep for rep basis, it's probably not going to build as much muscle as squats or whatever. But if you look at that and think of it as a strength, which you just said, Justin, which is I'm, I'm not going to need nearly as much recovery. Yeah, I can do this every single day, not get sore, and really send this really frequent muscle building signal to my lower body and train the entire leg from my foot all the way up. It's funny to, to me that these hypertrophy trolls can't get that in their skull, yeah. um, that it has a lot of value uh, to add in addition to squats and to um, all these, these other exercises that we do for, you know, building our, our leg muscles in particular, but like, yeah, gaining more strength and especially in the foot, like you had mentioned yeah. too, for me, like feeling more secure, more stable in my squats, it makes a massive difference in terms of performance. And now I can add more load, which then, you know, adds to that systemic effect where I do build, you know, substantially more muscle because now I'm more secure, more stabilized when I'm squatting down, I can, I can actually load more. I, I want to unpack something that you said, uh, about the difference between the, uh, eccentric portion and then the concentric portion. Uh, traditionally it's known that the eccentric portion of the exercise is what builds the most muscle. Yeah. Now, do you think that a, a big portion of that is because traditionally the eccentric portion of the exercise is always the slower part. Like you, you take two to four seconds to lower a weight down where the concentric portion of exercise many times is only one second. And so do you think that a lot of that, that benefits is just purely the time under load during that, that portion of the movement. <sighs> That's and, a good and, and, and if you were to compare, like, like let's just take total time and I'm going to make up these numbers just to, to make my point. Uh, you do a, a, a barbell back squat for five reps and the total time is 10 seconds 
in the eccentric portion mm -hmm. of the, you know, let's just say, even though it's probably wrong, 10 seconds. You go drive the sled now and there's no eccentric portion, but you have a total of 30 seconds of concentric uh, work to drive the sled across the gym. So the total amount of time that that muscle is being worked is, is equated to the same or potentially even more in that the driving sled. And do you, you think that that may be a factor in why mm. you are seeing such great results in comparison to what we know is the king of all exercises for building your legs? It could contribute. It's a sure. good question because we, we can't really, we still haven't really determined why the eccentric or the lowering part of an exercise quote unquote, builds more muscle. And I, I want to be clear before I continue, they all build muscle. So right. people get confused as they say- Isometrics build muscle. Yeah, so the I, oh, eccentric builds the most muscle. So therefore, concentric and isometric looks like a waste of time. No, 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 they all build muscle. But if you compare them head to head, eccentric tends to build more, but eccentric also comes along with more damage and more recovery. And right. you try, try a, a negatives only workout or force negatives or- where you're going, you're going to get super sore and it's going to take longer to recover. So there's that, that drawback, right? But as far as time under tension is concerned, it's interesting because what I've done with the sled is I've done it many different ways. So it's not like I do the exact same thing every day. Sure. So some days what I'll do is I'll, I'll load the sled and I'll push it as fast as I can. I'm not running, right. but I'm trying to go fast. But it's explosive versus long, slow grinding strides. Right, or okay. or 30 second rest versus rest as long as I can versus half the length of the grass with heavy, heavy, heavy weight versus lightweight. Let's see how fast I can get it across. So it's like a whole bunch of different varieties that I'm yeah. doing. So there's there's the, the portion that I was asking that I think has to be a contributor. Um, uh, how how direct it is is in, in relation. It might be right, right. I think that, and then the other contributor you have to think is because you've lifted for twenty plus years, you've you've built a substantial substantial amount of weight or strength and 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 size in your legs, and all it takes is some good stimulation to to maintain that mass. I would think that that also plays oh, for sure. Like, like if you had like a kid who's seventeen, two kids, seventeen, never lifted before. And uh, one kid, I get to do nothing but barbell squats with. The other kid, all I do is drive the sled with. I would still speculate that we would see significantly more gains in the barbell back squatter. But now take those same two kids 20 years later who have both built a lot of muscle by doing all different exercises and then allow them just to drive the sled. And they probably could, would. Could be, but here's the other side of it. First off, it's always, never, it's, we're not making the either or argument, right? Right. They all course, have value. So course. I don't want to, I don't want to get people get confused from me say that, you know, this exercise is better than all the others. Don't do anything else. The best results you're going to get are from doing a, a wide variety of different <clears throat> movements, doing eccentric, concentric, isometric contractions, uh, split stance exercises, bilateral. So all that stuff has lots of value. But here's the deal. I think if you compare uh, one kid doing barbell back squats three days a week to one kid driving the sled three days a week, you're going to see more gains with the back squat. However, here's the difference. The sled, you can do way more often than squatting. Right. Way more often than squatting. In terms of volume and frequency, you, you can really up I, I bet you I could drive the sled twice a day if I wanted to yeah. and feel totally fine. I feel zero, nothing in my joints whatsoever. Yeah. Versus when I squat or deadlift... And I'll, I'll, this is a statement I'll make right now. I guarantee you it'll be the last leg exercise I do yeah. uh, as I get older. As I get older, I bet you that'll be the thing that I do the vast majority of just because it feels so easy and safe on the body, even at high intensities. Yeah. So th my point with this is tr there's tremendous value. And when you look at an exercise, look at its weakness and see how you can make that a strength. And so the weakness with the sled is you don't do the eccentric. So how can yeah. we make that a strength? Oh, I can do this every well, single day. It's interesting to speculate on, you know, the value of that eccentric and what difference that is in, in, in comparison. Like, so what kind of different force demand that places on uh, the muscles. And, and so that being that you're fighting uh, forces that are actually pulling away, uh, say they're gravitational or say, you know, the load itself, um, you know, you're fighting that on top of also contracting versus you contracting and, and be, and then let, you can let off at any point and then there's no more force demand. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it, in terms of like that being communicated, I haven't heard anything really break that down. Yeah, well, well I, there are also, then there's a third component that I think that makes a, a, a big difference in this case for you also is that if you were to compare driving the sled and squats to you specifically, I think that driving the sled is more novel to your body than sure. since squats. So if you were a sled driver your whole life and then now you're like really starting to squat, totally. you would mm -hmm. see. So I think there's, I think that's what makes it 
so powerful for you is that there's 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 those three big uh, elements that make it. Uh, but I'll say this though, my legs, my upper legs, I should say, are pretty well developed. I mean, I, I think it's you guys know this. It's like the one body part I have that I, I could really build a lot of muscle. For me to get them to grow, um, I, I know what I'd have to do to really make them grow. Yeah. If I wanted to make them grow, I'm surprised that they're growing. Yeah. But and I know it's the frequency. It's you don't think so many reps. You don't think they're they're growing beyond a size though that you've already had them before. They're, uh, they're, at this body weight, um, like they're not that's the tough, biggest. Right? Yeah, I don't think they're the biggest they've ever. No, that's tough because I'm also 43. Right, right. I, so I, I mean, I a lot of know. that you're 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 bringing back muscle that you you've 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 had before. The thing that Justin you said that I think is really interesting. That's really important to that, and and you alluded to it also with how your joints feel. I, I would think that one of the most uh, damning things that the, the that happens to the body from like squats is the 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 change of direction of load always right so oh, the, yeah. the the eccentric That's where you get hurt. right the mm -hmm. eccentric portion and then, and then switch and then switch in the other direction with 300 pounds like right. that has just got to be the 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 sheer physics of that have to be one of the mm -hmm. the, the most stressful things that you uh, that you apply to the body where that's completely eliminated with the driving the sled you were just going forward to your point as soon as you let off it, you let it's off it's also like, so um it's also low skill driving the sled is low skill oh, yeah, meaning that's why I loved it for clients. great for kids anybody yeah. right if like a first time yeah. person exercising you can have them push a light sled I can't have or any joint issues like totally yeah, it's beautiful for that so it's just it's my point with all this is that the sled has been thrown into the like sports athletic realm and people who just want to develop their muscles don't typically look at the sled and say oh that's a good Mm -hmm. Muscle building exercise, false. Yeah, I actually, it's a great I ironically exercise. used it more yeah. during bodybuilding than I ever have in my life. I remember you saying that. Yeah, I used it all the time. I love the drags. I love pushes, and just like you said, some days it would be light and 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 more explosive. Other days it would be this grinding strength. Other days I would be dragging it slow. Sometimes I'd drag it up high. Sometimes I'd squat down and like almost simulate a leg extension. I drop my hips down like a oh, right drag now. it back. Yeah, and drag it back. Oh, that's as if I was doing a, uh -huh. a, a leg extension. And I mean, I remember after I found that, and I believe again it was working with Justin. I never did leg extensions again. Mm -hmm. I was like, why would I ever do a leg extension if I could pretty much emulate the same thing in a, in a in a where I'm actually moving? It's far more functional. I'm going to burn more calories. I'm going to build more strength from it, and it just it felt better doing that than yeah, sitting in a machine. There's also some clues too when you look at the um the, the the strength training realm of athletes that train with the highest frequency uh, of all you know strength athletes, which are Olympic lifters. Uh, Olympic lifters generally lift more often than any other lifter. They're, they train, I mean, you know, gosh, several times a day they'll practice their lifts. But Olympic lifts, many of their lifts don't include the negative portion of a repetition. They, they, they throw a weight up and they drop it. If you ever watch Olympic lifters lift, they don't do lots of negatives. And they might practice with squats, but even their squats, the negative is minimized. You ever watch an Olympic lifter squat versus a power lifter or a bodybuilder? Olympic lifter, like they go in the hole and they bounce back up. Now, I'm not recommending that. I think it's a very high skill movement. But my point with this is when you eliminate or, or somewhat limit the damaging effects of the eccentric portion of a rep, that means you could dramatically increase the volume and frequency. So it's, it's like, yes, eccentric portions of reps are very important. I'm not saying remove those, but if you did somewhat limit those or remove those like you would with a sled or if you're doing some type of an Olympic lift or maybe even modify other exercises to do so, you could dramatically increase the amount of times that you practice that exercise, which comes with its own benefits. Um, and it, the benefits are strength, muscle, performance, all that stuff. It's really interesting to me because, I, like I said, um, I did it every single day. I just got the sled. I did three sets, three to five sets every single day. And every day I felt good. I didn't feel yeah. like, oh, I got to go easy today. Like you do, like I would if I tried to squat every day. Yeah, yeah. I just said, well, I feel really interested. My knees feel good. My hips feel good. Ankles, everything felt really, really good. And it's such an easy tool to use. It's really, uh, really interesting. Well, you know that I hurt my hamstring the other day. So I, and I saw Doug doing the sled after you and I'm like, oh, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. So I'll report back. Because I haven't done that. I don't think I've I've actually just like when I did the sled a lot. I was doing it. In, you added it. In, in yeah, I've added it to increase volume. I it was my way of okay. I can't squat or deadlift anymore this week. It's too taxing, uh, but I still want to keep working my legs. And so the sled the sled drags and pushes became 
something I used a lot in bodybuilding, but I haven't done it like this, like right now. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that in replace of like some of my leg training and see see how see how. It Doug, goes. are you? How what day are you on now? Because you just started doing it every day. Yeah, it's probably about four or five days now. And what do you do? You feel okay? You feel I feel great. Uh, I mean, I definitely can tell that I've been doing something. Mm -hmm. My body is definitely. I, I feel it. in My muscles. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things though had happened for me is I'd hurt my knee a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I was still squatting, but I had a little bit of knee pain. And the nice thing about this is my knee is just like perfectly fine. Yeah, It'll be the exercise I do when I'm in my eighties. I guarantee it. It'll be yeah. like the one leg exercise that I'll always be <laughs> doing because it just doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. You know? it's, it's beautiful. Now they have those torque sleds and you have ones with wheels and you can adjust the, you know, the, the tension on them. So you can really, um, make it a lifestyle thing. Like I could just take it out of my garage and I just move it around and just like I would do anything else. It's just like a daily activity. How does it feel? I've never used a torque sled. It's great, man. Really? It's, is yeah, it, it's, is a torque sled the one with the, the, the big like four wheel wheels on it? Uh -huh. Yeah. Those look cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you can adjust and, and add some more resistance. So it kind of like, um, adds, I don't know if it's like a braking or some kind of like a, um, yeah, because I used to take the sled, the regular one that drags drag you know, outside my house. Such an asshole. You get dirty looks from my Five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> sparking. Yeah, Could you imagine Everything that? sparking everywhere. <laughs> Who is this I asshole? I did that down with the, with the high school kids down at the, uh, um, the, the campus, and it was like this beautiful uh, concrete area and everything. And like they, they had like some – plastic pieces on the bottom initially. So it was like, okay, I could push it. And then those came off and then it was just pure sparks. And like, we just put marks everywhere. I'm like, we can't do this. We got to order some of these Torx lens. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble with the administration. All right, here's the giveaway. It's the new program that we just launched. Maps, 15 minutes. So if you work out for 15 minutes every single day, you can get better results than if you did like two longer workouts during the week. We designed this program to be extremely convenient and extremely effective. And we also added a bonus advanced version for those of you that like compound heavy barbell movement. So there's a 20 to 25 minute daily workout you can do that's included in this program. I'm going to give one away for free though. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you got free access to maps. 15 minutes. Now, everybody else, it's a brand new program. We're just launching it. So here's what you get if you sign up right now. You get $20 off, plus you get two free eBooks, The Power of Sleep and The Occlusion Training Guide, both included for free, plus $20 off the brand new program, Maps 15 Minutes, which also includes the bonus advanced version. Again, for those of you that like heavy barbell lifting, go check this particular workout out. It's amazing. Go to Maps 15 Minutes Dot com and then use the code 15 special for the discount and the free giveaways. All right, here comes the show. <laughs> Speaking of grinding metal and the sparks and stuff, Adam, I want to hear about your, this is the second time now you've curbed your rims. Oh, God. Oh, Why dude. you to bring that to dirty? <laughs> <episode? laughs> no, that was on the agenda to talk about that, dude. This is like, how oh, dare you, sir? Bro, that's like, that's hey, like, hey, listen. You listen. only get two of these in your life as a man. Two, so you already hit uh, them. This uh, is, uh, so this has happened to me. Okay. Uh, Every car I've owned since I was 17 years old, except for one, uh, I've put custom wheels on. So I've been driving around with custom wheels since I was a kid on all my vehicles. And so I'm like, and I'm, I just, Jerry took my, I, you guys were in here, weren't you? And Jerry yeah. took the car. I'm like, oh, be careful. You know, like I make a big deal about the rims, right? <laughs> be careful when you park that, you know? And uh, driving, I'm, I'm driving the car the other day. And uh, dude, it was, it was probably the worst era. I'm at Starbucks. And I, I I pull up to to go pay, and it was like, oh, oh as she's I opening the that. window. Thank God she didn't make a big deal about it because like inside I was like so angry, <laughs> wanted to blame it on somebody. But th this is the second time it's happened to me, and it's only happened in the Starbucks driveway. So they have the low ass. They curb have low, yeah. and they do the 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 hard turns. Yeah. It's like if you're like, and I, okay, I'm in my car, so shame on me. I still should have been fine because my car is little in comparison to like the, the truck or my SUV. And so like when I'm in the truck and SUV, it's hard not to drive up on the curb yeah. on there because it's such a tight, narrow turn. Yeah. And then when you pull up to the, the Starbucks window, the, the window is the curb sticks out further than the window. So if you want to get up close, like some of those ATMs and stuff like yeah. that to where you don't have to like open the door to, I have to get close and, oh, Bro, I'd curb the fuck out of the rims, dude. I'm so 
I'm so angry about that right oh, now. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, it's only happened to me twice, both times in Starbucks. So the two times that I've done it, once was at the mall because in the parking lot they had um, – curbs in the middle of the parking lot to show you where to turn but they're so low you can't kind of you really can't see them very well so i turn and it's like and it's like ruin the whole day and i'm so pissed off right <laughs> that's one time the other time was at a starbucks and it wasn't pulling into the window it was turning out yeah because when you turn out they have two curbs that make you you have to turn and if you don't hit them perfectly you'll hit the back it's rim. they're so narrow they, 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 they make those driveways hell and narrow. But there's something and, about it, too, that's, first off, it's infuriating because uh, it's well, your current grade around. it up so it's not like a hard I think that that's lines. the part that pisses me off. Like, I, I, I can't, you can tell I'm not the only one that does it. Yeah, I mean, I the, 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 the whole so the fucking thing has just got marks all <laughs> yeah, around yeah. it. So it's like it happens <laughs> to so many people. And I'm like, <laughs> this is like the type of person I am. I'm like, I'm so angry at Starbucks. Like, I'm not going to drink Starbucks for like a year. I'm a Pete's guy now. I know they won't feel that. That, but it's like I'm so angry about it. It's like you lose my five dollars a fucking day for the next year because I'm so mad that that's like such a simple fix. Like make the curb smooth or widen it by two feet or like or make the door thing, the window thing, hang out by six more inches instead of it being inside. It's like why yeah. you would think that there would be some kind I mean, of I've a jumped it with the truck for sure. I know yeah. you're talking. Well, about. when you got a truck, who gives a shit? You just yeah, run over just everything. I have moto yeah. over everything. Yeah, they thing. you would think because in our in my car I have sensors if I get too close or whatever. Yeah. But for some reason. It doesn't work with just the rims. No, you would think that they would do that by now. For some, like okay, that. some some luxury cars do have that. Okay, yeah, just yeah. for the rims. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Some some will have have a three sixty camera that will now. What I, well, that's what I do now is I hit the camera and I yeah. watch from the camera. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Because it's hard to judge, especially when you're trying to turn. Yeah, because your Beamer has the park assist, doesn't yep. it? Where it gives you a three sixty view yeah, of yeah, all yeah, of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I, I mean, I I have that, and I didn't even I didn't hit that. I just don't. I didn't think that to do it, especially when I was in my car. My car is small. And for some reason, too, it's also just. I don't know why, but just as a man, it's the most embarrassing thing to get repaired. Well, it is because here, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, you go to the super sexist. I'm saying that to J uh, Jerry when she walks in, like, <laughs> be careful the rims. Fucking next day, I curb the shit out of my wheels. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, ah. So, yeah, no, yeah. it's freaking awful, that's dude. super uh, annoying. Ruin my day, dude. That totally ruined my uh, day. Yeah, sorry it's, for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. dirty. I didn't know you were going to go. <laughs> hey, so uh, I got to tell you guys something really interesting. So, you know, one of my, you know, you guys know this. One of my favorite things is when old wisdom gets proven right by science like mm -hmm. things that like that we would call let's say old wives tale mm -hmm. right like do this if you have a cold or do this if you feel this particular right. way is and it then, wives tale or wise tale wives wives, wives. old wives tale why is it an old wives tale um uh, because moms and wives were the ones that would administer care when you were ill or sick and historically it was the women that knew which herbs and plants and remedies to give to their children. So like if you had a cough and they gave you honey, honey uh, to help you with your cough and stuff like that, right? It wasn't dad, it was mom. So they, they, they labeled them old wives tales because what they try to do is they try to discredit them and say, well, there's no evidence to support that this particular thing works. And, uh, it's just an old wife. So, so it's a way of saying that's bullshit. Right, saying an old oh, wife's tale like, is a way it's like saying uh, like an urban legend. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. So, so here's what's in. So yesterday we had our doula come and visit because um, you know we're like, I think we're four weeks away from from due date, and we've got this really amazing doula. She's super smart, wonderful, wonderful woman, and we hung out for like three hours. I mean, it was only supposed to be an hour, you know, meeting or whatever. We're hanging out, we're talking, and great conversations about delivery and birth, and she's telling stories about some of the shit that she's heard doctors say when, you know, women are trying to give birth. For example, this is, getting, this is going a little sideways, but I thought this was interesting. So, you know, when a baby's born and the baby comes out, the umbilical cord is still attached and the placenta is still in the mom. The mom still has to deliver the placenta. Well, the cord and the placenta continue to pump blood into the baby. And it's essentially the baby's blood. Right. So the whole like del delayed cord clamping, yeah. that's where that's from. Yeah. Now, here, if you go to the hospital and you, get, and you deliver a baby, delayed cord clamping, they'll give you 30 seconds maybe, maybe a minute. She's like, I'm lucky if they let me do it for a minute. I said, well, when you do home deliveries or you go to uh, like a birthing center, like a, run by midwives, how long do you wait? She goes, till it's done, till the placenta is delivered. And she was talking about how, so she makes, um, she'll make like uh, tinctures and stuff out of the placenta because this is a, a traditional remedy for you know, postpartum depression, or whatever, and women will take it. So this is an old practice. And she says, I could tell when I get the umbilical cord and the placenta from 
women who delivered in hospitals versus birthing centers. She goes, one still got blood in it. The other one's pale because it pumped it back into the baby. So we're talking all these stories and stuff. And then we're talking about like things that can help induce labor. So she goes, oh, let's, let's get you some medjool dates. Do you guys know what medjool dates are? Well, you know what dates are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So medjool is a, is a type of a date. She goes, yeah, you eat these, eat these. And, and it helps with uh, better labor, more likely to, to have the, you know, better cervical ripening and all these different things. And I'm like, dates? Yeah. She's like, yeah, they, we've, they've been used for thousands of years. In fact, one of the Isn't first- is that the one in uh, Indiana Jones where the, the monkey ate it and, and died because it was poison? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're not poisonous. I don't know if- Check, check that, that Fact random, check me on that one, but that's random, that's true. He's got to make Anyways, up for his not knowing Star Wars. Medjool day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I know my Harrison Ford um, <laughs> movies yeah, anyway. So, so she was saying this, right? So I'm like, what? So I'm like, this is fascinating. Because so far, everything she said to me, I've gone back and looked it up and found like all this evidence and stuff. So I'm like, this is so fascinating, right? Like, mm. why don't we ever talk about this stuff? Yeah, yeah. So I looked it up. Their studies have been done on medjool dates and they definitely help induce labor and they definitely help with better labors. And there's huh. several studies that support this. Some of the first times it was used or or recorded to be used was in the times of uh, when Jesus was born. This yeah. is an old practice that women and midwives have been doing for a long time. Interesting. I didn't know that about dates. I mean, I've heard all these different spices and like the spicier the food um, that goes, helps to induce labor. Uh, and, and so in, in Courtney's case, this was actually true. There was like a pizza that um, this place was like famous for uh, that a lot of pregnant ladies would go to and like eat it. And it was like the spiciest, craziest <laughs> really? pizza and, and eating it. And we're walking up West Cliff and, and um, you know, I think it was really like a lot of it was the walking and going upstairs and yeah. the whole thing. But like <laughs> it for sure that night her water broke and it was like on like Donkey Kong. So <laughs> I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so check this, by the way. He looked up the dates, and it wasn't a medjool date. It was just a date that he ate the, in Indiana Jones. So you're half right. It was just a date. I don't know what the difference is, to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't know what a medjool what date is, is a regular okay. date. I don't know, but we're going to go buy them. It's probably just where a region it's from, I would imagine. I have right? no idea, but check this out, right? So one study showed that uh, that it, it prompted cervical ripening in pregnant mothers who were 37 to 38. So after the study, researchers found that mothers who ate 70 to 75 grams of dates every day, so like five or six dates a day, had lower rates of C-section, lower rates of vacuum or forceps use, lower rates of oxytocin, pitocin use, and higher Bishop scores at the onset of labor. In another study, researchers had 65 women eat six dates a day for four weeks leading to their date of delivery and left 45 pregnant women without any dates. Okay, So they did a control and whatever. At the mm -hmm. end of the study, spontaneous labor occurred in 90... 96% of those who consume the dates compared to 79% mm. of the women who didn't have the dates. Also, the women who ate dates had lower rates of uh, Pitocin use and shorter first stages of labor. Hmm. Dates. Dates, man. Now, you know what's funny? Before studies like this, could you imagine bringing that up to like a, a Western medicine like practitioner, doctor? They oh, laugh yeah, at you in your laugh, face. Laugh you out of the They're building. Like dates of fruit. <laughs> now, I you, love this kind of stuff. Have you checked to see if, like, uh, you know, because there's there's like stacks of like pills that the doctor tell you, recommends now for your, I'm sure your wife to to take, right? Like the, um, what is it? There's a prenatal, prenatal vitamin. Thank you. Well, not just prenatal, but there like a whole. There's like a whole plethora of different vitamins I've seen that are sure. recommended at different stages sure. of the pregnancy and leading up to the birth. Have you looked to see if like there, some of those already have that in there? I wouldn't be surprised if they've extracted that and then put it in some of the I supplements. I mean, you know, here's a the deal. There's So I did look this up. What I said, what's in these dates that's doing this? It's like it's high in fiber. It's got good antioxidants. It's got B vitamins. It's got some iron. I'm like, that can't be it, right? There's something else. That we just haven't identified. Yeah, because all those things are in like your prenatal. There's all kinds yeah. of foods that have that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like there's all kinds of fruit that has all that kind of stuff, not just dates. Right. And why have dates, why have these dates been used for thousands of years? And why mm. have they shown and why are they showing to have this effect? I find this kind of stuff fascinating. And what this shows me is old wisdom, we're so quick to discard if there isn't a study backing it up. Right. But old wisdom, yes, it's anecdote, but it's anecdote that's been done, that's been backed by well, thousands of years of people of, uh, and you know millions of people using this particular thing or doing a particular thing 
There's something to We're it. We're also quick to jump to conclusion on what it is that it's that's happening. Right. Like, oh, it's got fiber, this and this. Maybe B that's vitamin, what it is. iron, vitamin. Okay, let's take that, extract that, put that in a pill, and right. now we've yeah. got the best benefits it's concentrated. of concentrated. Yeah. yeah, assume that that's what it is, and there's not something else there. That's the part yeah. that drives me. The crazy other stuff that was very interesting. So I was listening to a podcast. Uh, gosh, can you please look up Dr. Becky Campbell's podcast? I want to give her a shout out. She did an amazing podcast with a OBGYN who now does home deliveries. So he's a doctor, surgeon. Now he does home deliveries and he talks about the whole process of birth in the hospital. And he said a couple things on there that were so um, just riveting to me. He said, first off, he said, having a baby, he's like, you ain't going to stop it. Your body's, it's going to happen. He's like, it's, it's like trying to, it's like trying to, you have to go, you have to poop, try stopping it. It's going to happen at some point. <laughs> He's like, it's a natural, it's a, it's an automatic thing that happens. That on my way to work. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. It's an automatic thing that happens to your body. And he goes, also adrenaline stops the process of labor. So he says, so when an animal, for example, is, is giving birth or, or in the process of labor, and then there's a forest fire, labor will stop so that the animal can right, escape. Right, or a predator or something. Right. And, she, and he goes, what do you, what do you, what's the name of the podcast, by the way? Health Babes. Health Babes. There you go. Great podcast. Health Babes. Then he says, you know, what do you do, what do, you do when you have a pet that's going into labor, right? You what do they say? Leave it alone. Be quiet. Let it do its thing, right? Because that helps everything happen. He goes, you want to know why so many women go into labor, go to the hospital, and all of a sudden stop? He goes, they show up in labor. Fill out these forms, hook you up to these wires. Mm -hmm. Let me check your cervix. Let me stick my hand inside you. Let's see what's going on. And then he's like, and then we wonder why labor stops so often when women all of a sudden go to the hospital. I'm like, oh my God, this is so yeah. crazy. The whole we're white coat syndrome. Yeah, yeah. We're treating this like so wild, you know? So anyway. why, why is that so controversial though? That's, I think that's so interesting. It's, <sighs> because it's so mm -hmm. embedded in how we view certain things that I, I was it years ago. Remember years ago, I, I, I said on the podcast how childbirth was so dangerous. And then a midwife contacted us and was like, no, you're actually wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not. Here's why. And she totally, you know, explained everything to me. And I was like, oh shit, I was wrong. I had no idea. Yeah. But I mean, really fascinating stuff. So a, a lot of the stuff that we think is just like whatever, I mean, look into it. It's really interesting. Is Jessica uh, is Jessica using the juve because Katrina used the juve during her pregnancy? Did she? Did she? Is she for used... stretch marks? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it definitely works for yeah. sure. It definitely works at uh, preventing and or reducing the appearance of stretch. But that's backed by data, hundred yeah. percent, with red light therapy. So, like, especially after you have your baby, you can use it. Um, I think during you can use it a little bit as well. I, I laid there with him too. So I did, we did both. Mm. So we, we she, I laid there with him. I asked my doctor, you know, if it, he thought it was fine. He said, absolutely. There's no problem with that. So I, I used to lay with Max afterwards, but she was really consistent with that. That was like one of her biggest, like, she, one of her big fears of having a kid was like having stretch marks. Yeah, having yeah. stretch marks afterwards. She didn't have anything, but that was like, she, she was very, adamant about training consistently deadlifting squatting all the way up until where max came out and then and using the uh, red light she did both those things mm -hmm. like super consistent that's awesome How, is there anything different uh that jessica's doing this pregnancy versus the last one yeah um a couple things she's not trying to overdo it i think she thinks we she may have overdone like the workouts and the split stance exercises um and single leg exercises that may have caused some torsion on her pelvis mm. um, while she was pregnant with Aurelius. Oh, interesting. So she's just much more careful. It's like She's like, oh, I'm super sedentary. And that's funny because, like I said, the doula came and she's like, well, what's different this time? She's like, well, I'm really sedentary. So she's like, well, define sedentary. So she's explaining to her, she's like, you're not sedentary. You're just you're just taking it easier compared to right. what you did the first time around. And so that, that would be a different And are thing. they, they're obviously probably very pro that they're probably telling her that's not a good, bad thing. There's though. a balance. Like you can overdo sure, it, sure. you know, for sure. So that would be the bigger, I think the bigger difference. And then of course she, you know, she, she has a little kid to take care of while she's pregnant. So that's, <laughs> that makes things a lot different. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just her. How is he right now? I, is, how's his, how's the phase? Uh, you sent the video. Did last, you guys see what he's, did you the, see the video that? trying to say oh, truck was hilarious. Yeah, he says, dude, he says so truck, funny. but he says fuck. <laughs> so I'm having fun with him right now. I'm like, really? I say truck. Fuck. I'm like, say, oh, truck. Oh, fuck. It's so funny. <laughs> Jessica's like, stop. Immediately reminded me of the meet the fuckers where, where he's watching that little kid and, and he starts saying like, ash. Whoo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, 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 you don't want to say that word, though. We don't want to say that word because that's a bad word. <laughs> he gets in trouble for that. It is funny. My kids were dying, like, watching that video oh, of yeah. him trying to say true. Oh, I love It's hilarious. Yeah. So now it's like, you know, I, I try to get him to say it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> such, a fun, such a fun age right now. It dude. is. Yeah, it's, yeah. And he says, it's funny, too, because uh, I don't know, does Max do this? Well, he says a word that he kind of made up to mean something. So you have to figure out, like, what the hell is he saying? Like, what is that? He so he's doing something now. He did something the other day that I thought was really cute. That um, it reminded me of my so my uh, my youngest sister <clears throat> is like what is she twelve years younger than me, ten or twelve years younger than me. Um, and when she was his age growing up, and if we were the adult, the adults were in the room or in older I was a teenager at that time, were in the room. We and if we were to use a swear word, yeah. we would spell it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so we'd like. Mm -hmm. S-H-I-T, you know, like yeah. if we were up, and so, so yeah. the baby couldn't pick it up. And I remember Sarah developed this thing where she started to pick up on, it's so amazing how, 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 like how we do this, right? Like she, she learned to pick up on that. We would spell something when there was like an, an emotion of like anger or frustration. Mm. That was when we, so she, she it together. so she pieced that together. And I, I saw, I caught Max do the same thing, right? Cause there's been a couple of times where I cussed by spelling it to Katrina in front of him so he didn't hear me hear me cuss so he does it, it, they're not the same letters but sarah is it's still is stuck in my head she used to go psrt right she get she'd be doing something and she'd get frustrated <laughs> psrt she was, throw some yeah it was always those combined. those same letters yeah she just knew to say these letters and those were the letters that came to her mind yeah and she would she knew to do it when she was frustrated or mad or whatever like that and so she would it, it was her way of spelling a, a curse word but she had no idea what she was doing and so I caught him doing that the other day of, of, of spelling, trying to spell something that I spelt that was a bad word. It was completely off. Like he, <laughs> he's not spelling anything, you know what I'm saying? But he gets that, you know, dad said that when he was frustrated about something or expressing emotion. It's just wild that they, they, they pick up yeah, on he's at, like he's that. Yeah, now he's at that age where he just, he says words that I didn't even know he knows. Like mm -hmm. we were looking at a book and he goes, treasure. I'm like, treasure? Who the hell taught you treasure? You know? Yeah. yeah. He just words are just popping yeah. out left and right. Yeah. His mm. thing right now, and I don't know where he gets, where he, this is, hmm. He puts his hand on his. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He puts his hand on, on his, hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to, hmm. I'm like, what are you hooming about, dude? <laughs> he's, yeah. he's, uh, walk around, that, like we'll be playing or doing something. And I'll be like, what do you want to do? Hmm. <laughs> and then he'll walk, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you do? He knows where, so we use. I, I actually I don't think I shared this with the audience. Um, for his 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 potty training, uh, we did use these little tiny dum dum suckers, right? So up until this point, we've really had like no sugar, and uh, and then Katrina read that read. Uh, I don't remember what book. I know people are going to ask me, so I'll, I'll look it up. Uh, read a book, and they and it actually addressed parents that have avoided using sugar and like you know don't be afraid. This is something that you can do for this short period of time mm -hmm. and you can remove it out of their diet. It's not going to, you know, alter the kid's palate forever. And so it really relieved her of that because up until this point, we've been very strict yeah. about, you know, introducing sugar foods to him. So at like that, and, and this was obviously a very, I, you know, it's funny too. Like the, the potty training phase was more challenging than I, I think a lot of people made it sound. I actually never heard a lot of people talk about it. I don't remember it that much for some reason with my younger siblings. Well, that that for us, but boy, that was that was an intense week for us mm -hmm. of like really, especially the first three days because we did the whole three day thing where he's like naked and and you like just you're you're every five minutes yeah. you're asking him, you know, it's such a timing thing. It, oh, it's a it's a crazy timing thing, and and you can really see how quickly. That's why I, I commend Katrina for for really owning this because I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I know probably day two or three of asking my son every 15 minutes, you have to pee and taking him to the toilet like a hundred times that he doesn't go. I'd get lazy. I know I'd be like, uh, you know, just let me know, you yeah, know, yeah, and then yeah. I'm sure, but she, she, she executed that really well. And if he, if he pooped in the toilet, he would get a lollipop, but now he's connected you know, the lollipop to that and then also where it's at. So he's, you know, he walks around the house and hmm, yeah. acting like he doesn't know where it's at. Hmm. Yeah. And he'll stand underneath the, where the, where it's, where it's I up. I wonder in the, what's here. Yeah. Mm, yeah. He's like, mm, I wonder what's in there. <laughs> and he points out for you, open it like, nah, bro. But, uh, so that was our, our first introduction to, uh, sugar and, but it's been great because she's like already, cause it's now been what, almost two weeks. 
uh, obviously he doesn't get a lollipop every time he poops anymore. And he's already started to forget about it. You know, every once in a while she'll, he'll remember. And then she normally will let him every now and does then. Does he give you one after you poop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> Good so job. We, he did. Uh, you get two of so them. So he's, he's literally, uh, so this is the toilet, uh, his 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 wiener is like right here, right? So, <laughs> so he we, just hits the seat. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we, him on. and I are getting ready to get in the bath the the just like a couple of nights ago, and um, Katrina was just saying to me like, I, okay, now that he's like he's like totally potty trained now, let's start trying to teach him how to stand up. And I said, yeah, he's. I said, I I, I said I've been watching. I said he's just. We need about two more inches for it to be like really good. <laughs> oh, <it's gonna laughs> be right, right. <laughs> so I I had him. I had him like two nights ago before getting the bath to to do it. We're both standing there naked and stuff like that. And I'm and I'm holding it going over. And he's like, lean, he's holding on to me and like leaning. He's trying to get yeah, in. Yeah, 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 we're both peeing in there. So that's so that was like a, a for sure moment. I'll never. You got to get him a little toilet. You know. Yeah. yeah. So he's got like he's got one of those little. Uh, Little plastic ones. You know what? Oh, you know what he uses that I didn't even know this existed. So I, I don't know if you guys got this or if you had this, but it's a travel potty that folds completely flat. Hmm. It it uh it uh, so it completes this flat. It oh like this bink bink and opens up, and it is it has like you know about it sits about this high with the the legs that pop under, and then you have these plastic bags that go over the top of it, and then he sits right on it, and then you just close it up, and then you throw, oh, it, throw it away. Huh. Oh wow. He's oh. so comfortable doing that. And when we drive, so we keep it in the back of the the, the rover. And then when he's got to go, he'll just tell Katrina and he goes, sits back there. He wants the, the, the back closed. So he sits back there and he <laughs> asks you to close the door. And so he, he closes. Some takes, privacy, please. Yeah, dude. He takes a shit in there and then waits, waits. And then she'll, Katrina will pop her head in every car. I don't think they one for adults, damn oh it. My God, I know. Dude. I thought that. And then no problem doing that. He like he yeah. actually likes doing that. He has this thing where when he poops, he wants to be alone. Oh, all kids. Yeah, Aurelius, yeah, Aurelius will try and hide. And then he does this. He covers his face, his eyes with his, yeah. with his hands. So he does this. So it doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. We're at my mom's the other day and and he was just he walked over to the corner and he covered his eyes and then we're like, right, yeah, I know exactly what's He's trying to yeah, right poor now. kids trying to poop right Dude, now. Dude, uh so we're in a kind of a different spot, but uh uh Ethan's really at that kind of phase where he's embarrassed by us now, right? So mm. he's like going full into like the teenage mode oh, yeah. and is like trying to be cool kid and like You're such a cool dad. See you though, later. Actually. Doesn't you matter, know, bro. Guys, dude, I, that's what I thought, right? I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm pretty cool. You're pretty cool. Like I, I think we're gonna do okay, but apparently we're not cool enough. So it, it was it was funny that um Courtney, so the kids got into gymnastics because uh, I I guess I was talking to Courtney about this when she was a kid, she always wanted to do it and her parents like never let her. And so this was kind of a a, a goal of her. She didn't even really tell me about right, that. Right to live vicariously through Yeah, it, and I didn't know that she had attached that and, and you know, somewhat was really into it. Because I saw her kind of watching a lot of the practices and would kind of go out there and go on the trampoline. One of the days they let the parents kind of come in. And I, I missed out. I wanted to do it with her too, but uh, missed out my opportunity. But I guess they actually have like an adult class. So that like one day a week, they have a gym. And I was like, that sounds dangerous, right? For adults, <laughs> like, this, is, this is absurd. This is crazy. Uh, just tumbling. So now just rolling yeah. on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. So I'm like, <laughs> like Courtney's like, we're going to do this. Like, let's do this. And you like, too. We're talking about this. Yeah. Cause I was like, you know, I, I want to, I always want to challenge my body in different ways. And this was one of those, I actually did a whole course, a gymnastic course, like a long time ago. Um, just when I was going through different certifications, Bro, I want to see you do a backflip so bad, <laughs> dude, I can't like even just doing like a front roll, like tucking, like I don't have like the thoracic, uh, flexibility. I just would flop. I'd get to this point. Please like, Andrew boom. Photoshop a leotard on this guy. Dude, <laughs> give me, give me, give me, oh, I'm going all in you guys. You have no idea. Oh, so because what does he, does man, he, does exactly. He, so he's going to be in the class before us and he'd have to wait for us right oh after God. that. No, well, yeah, of I'm going to just be like, I'm here with Ethan. <laughs> shirt you know and i'm gonna be there like waving to him and doing flips and all this bro he's hold like, on a second so mad hold at on me. a second don't blame it on being a teenager that's embarrassing as hell would you want to watch <laughs> your parents do gymnastics oh my god i know dude that, that is that's up, why i want to do it that dude. is hilarious i'm embarrassed that i'm not even, not even yeah. my dad i don't want to go watch that now, you, you're okay so you're you just made me think wait. of something that i think is uh interesting now you obviously you have two boys so you don't have to deal with this but <clears throat> i've always thought like if i had a girl 
one of the things like that would probably be one of the more challenging things as a father is when your daughter starts to get into like, you know, teenage womanhood years and she wants to start wearing the kind of like risque clothes. Doug is sure. probably the one who can speak to this the most. Uh, is like that wants to use the, the cute tops and the sure. shorter shorts and stuff sure. like that. Like, oh my God, how do I handle this as a dad? And I think the best way is, is as a dad is you show up to school. Wearing the same shit. Yeah, wearing the same Pick her shit. Up. I feel the, like that's the only the Daisy Dukes. That's the only thing you could do, right? Like, you, I think if you you push her too hard, she's going to rebel. So I think the only thing that you could do as a dad is like to embarrass her. That like, listen, this is how I feel. This when I'm dropping you off. You yeah. look like this. I feel the same way. You know, so. <laughs> Thankfully, my daughter's not there at all. Well, she yet. has uniform. She's still Young. Well, but she doesn't want to either. She's not very much like a, I'll wear this or wear that. She's very cons so far, right? She's oh. only thirteen, so who knows if that might change? But yeah, but do you think? Okay, so another good question in in regards to that, and I do eventually want to hear Doug's opinion on that situation. Uh, do you think that? Because uh, I I actually like the idea of uniforms for schools um, for that. Because I actually think that. Do you think that played a role in why it isn't that big of a deal to her? Because she's been trained for so many years that. You go to school in a uniform where when I, I grew up in public schools where you could wear whatever you wanted. I so I was very much so into I think what I was. Yourself. I yeah, think yeah. a uniform is a great thing in schools. I think it's great. I think it eliminates two, a few different things. One, it makes it harder for kids to be like, well, I got this, you got that. I'm, mm, you know, this, whatever. Mm. I think it also takes <laughs> that out of the equation yeah. where, you know, you start playing with the risque clothes and yeah. the... Um, and also as a kid, now looking back, I think kids will be like, I want to wear what I want. But the reality is, think of all the stress and stuff you went through as a kid, or deciding what to wear and what. I, and if that was just taken out because you couldn't, probably would have made things. Well, a it's also a a small microcosm of what like social media is comparing yourself. Totally. You show up and you see so and so's got whatever shoes, yeah. or she has whatever yeah. dress, or he's got whatever you know designer jeans, and you don't like. I mean, when we all are in the same uniform, there's less of that kind of comparing to each other. I think that that is probably now, Doug. You have the opposite challenge, right? Because she doesn't, Bree doesn't have a uniform, right? No uniform. So, and she does like the kind of uh, you know crop top. I mean, we went shopping actually for school clothes. They don't sh sell whole shirts. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. I, I was like, looking. Oh, I, hey, could you imagine Doug like walking in the shop? And I, like, they're like, honey, where, shirts. where are the full shirts at? <laughs> I, we were, she needs them for school because her school doesn't re allow crop tops. And so we were going to, I don't know how many different stores, like five different stores. And I was looking everywhere. I was really searching because yeah. I really wanted her to get those. And they don't sell them. It's so hard to find those. Wow. That's wild. Wow. So you take her to like the big and tall store. Yeah. <laughs> Buy two shirts, honey. We're gonna sew them together. It's really tough. But you know, your your whole idea of coming to school dressed like that, I've threatened her with that, but yeah. it didn't seem to phase her much. That's why you gotta do she it. She calls her well, yeah, it's wait, who's gonna what what's the what's the end result gonna be? I'm gonna look like a fool and she's not gonna pay any attention to me. And the, the truth is I just bite my tongue a lot yeah. about yeah. her clothing. Uh I do you know, chime in here and there when I think things are like way over the top. But yeah. I don't want to be that dad too. That's always like, Oh, well, you got to, you know, put on a turtleneck. Well, yeah. Cause then the, it, then she rebels anyways. Then, yeah, she, then exactly. she put the turtleneck on and then underneath she has something even sluttier and then she pulls it off when she, well, she gets that, out for school. Or the something challenge like that. that I have with that is walking around with your daughter and they start to grow up, right? They start to become a woman. And you know, if they dress a particular way, you can imagine catching the glances of grown men or, 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 you know, guys that are way older or whatever, looking at your kid, like, how are you going to react in public? Like, nice. I don't know how I'm going to react in public. Cause I know how overprotective I am. So maybe she wouldn't wear them just cause she doesn't want her dad <laughs> to embarrass her by yelling at people. You know, I don't know, <laughs> but I can't imagine walking with my daughter and, and catching some dude look at her and then being like, I got to oh. think that a lot. I mean, cause she's the whole time she's been uniformed, right? Yeah. Yeah. See, I think that has more to do with that. I think that she she just doesn't even know any better. Had you gone to a school where everybody is dressed different, which yeah. is more Bree's upbringing, where she's seen that her whole life. Well, now where she goes now, they have school. They, her school does have a pretty strict dress code, <laughs> right? They do, which is good. Mm -hmm. Which I think is good. So even if my so the high school my daughter might go to doesn't have a uniform, but they do have a dress code. Yeah, but that's stricter than what you would find like at a public school. Did you guys have dress codes at all? We Dude. couldn't wear we couldn't wear like uh, gang colors. Like yeah, kind of, uh, that yeah. was the thing in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't wear. Don't like, wear too much yeah, red or blue. A whole lot of that. I mean, there was just a lot of flannels and hick, you know, gear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where I grew up, it wasn't anything that uh, flashy. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't like we had like strict. I mean, for 
in terms of like having to short of shorts and you know all that kind of stuff like yeah i think they had basic standard stuff like that but nothing crazy yeah well i mean you know i had a rude awakening well not rude awakening just a realization going to europe as a teenager like you think that kids dress risque here go to like italy france oh it's more there huh oh my God. I mean, I don't know if it's like that now, but it was when I was a kid. I couldn't believe the shit. Oh, that, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. I couldn't believe what they were I thought wearing. we were like the worst when it comes to that. No. Go to Brazil. Go to like, uh, you know, I, I like I said, I don't know what it's like now, but when I was a teenager going to Italy, I'd see my cousins who were my age or younger, and I couldn't believe what they were wearing. And I was like, I thought, Dad, I thought you said that, you know, our culture doesn't, whatever. He's like, it's changed a lot since I was a kid. I was like, yeah, because this is, <laughs> this is crazy, you yeah. know? They're very, they're, they're, they're very lax about that, that kind of stuff over there. Well, like, isn't it, it over there is too where they could have the commercials that have like uh, sexual commercials and nudity and stuff like that? Oh, I remember. It used to be like that. Bro, maybe. I remember 13, 12 or 13, I'm watching TV at my grandma's house <clears throat> in Sicily, and there's a soap commercial. And there's a woman in the shower, and you're looking through the glass of the shower and it's sudsy. So you can kind of see her, like her silhouette. And then she wipes the suds off and she's topless. This is a commercial <laughs> in the middle of the day. Remember this, I was 12 or 13. Yeah. This is before uh, internet, you know? Like, so I'm like, Whoa. Awesome. it's still like that, right? Is Buy it like that? that? So, you know, if it's like that still, I don't know. I think it is. Yeah. I think, I think, well, we, they're just more lax with nudity in general. You yeah, go to a yeah, beach the over the beaches yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah. Nudity in itself isn't, bad I, th I think it's the suggestion and the way that it can be used but nudity itself is just a human body right well and i think that's how they do those commercials right they're more like that where it's just she's just in the shower it's normal to be naked in the shower but they wouldn't be showing like pornographic images. no not that but they did do it because it was an attractive woman come on <laughs> yeah, pretty sure they were advertising just they know this is what we do when we shower yeah. <laughs> no they, they use the it. model and i remember it distinctively <laughs> yeah. very clear what happened there? Anyway, Justin, I want to hear about the shark attacks. You were supposed, you were supposed to bring, bring that up. up. Yeah, yeah, I was just literally going to talk about it because I didn't realize like the last year or so, there's been two reported shark attacks in our area in, off of uh, Pacific Grove, Lover's Point. And, so near uh, me. Same place. Yeah, and two different oh. sharks. Uh, oh, wow. Great whites. And so one guy that was on a uh, paddle board, I guess, got attacked and he was out there with his dog. Uh, both both were fine. I guess he, he was injured. The guy before that that was attacked, like had um, got serious injuries to his stomach and, and leg and like got isn't, like bit. Isn't that isn't where you're at that part of Northern California, the beaches there, but isn't that one of the highest concentration of great white sharks or like yeah. roughly they're, they're def definitely part of the, I don't know if it's like a migratory pattern where they, it they, is. they come up and then they stay there. They come all the way from Mexico and work their way up. Yeah. So, so yeah, usually there in, in Aptos is another one where this cement, uh, ship that was, that's what that's right there's like yeah. an underwater ship or something yeah there's one there and so that's like i always see them there like even if you you don't hear about any reports or what do you mean you see them okay so we we've taken <laughs> we've mean, taken what, these what sailboats out you see them well i mean did you <laughs> see I literally them saw them <laughs> yeah like you could Fuck see that. we took a catamaran and and it goes along the coast <clears throat> uh with the kids and we're you know having a nice sunday and we look over and there's probably five great whites just doing their thing. Maybe like, I want to say like 200 yards or so away from the shore. Oh, hell no. And so then there's people, there's surfers there and there's people swimming in the water, just oblivious that they're like just a ways out um, doing their thing. But yeah, they're, I'm just, I'm, I pretty much think they're everywhere. Uh, when I'm out in, in the ocean, I'm like, they're here. Like, it's just a, a matter of you, if they're hungry. Is it, a, is it, a, is it true that the, you're, you're most likely to get attacked if you have like a shiny type of material on or shiny clothes on? Like I heard that, that, that they're attracted to that. Like they don't want to eat like a human being. It's when I thought, I, now I thought it was it's different. I thought it was when you were, when you wore a black, uh, um, wetsuit. Yeah. Because you look like a, a seal. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, that's to what look I that heard. up. Yeah, because I I don't know which one they're more attracted to. Because I've kind of heard both uh, in terms of like if you have something. Well, those too are very opposite. Because yeah, know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so well, because we fish, you know, like they have reflective quality to them, right? Yes. And then uh, seals, it, it probably depends on, I guess, what they're hungry well, for. Well, so so it's so funny you brought that up because I just read a statistic that highlights um, how irrational fear can be. Right? I know. It's like, we hear about sharks. And you're it's like, like more likely to get hit with like lightning, yeah, aren't you? It doesn't you're, happen. More, more people die every year from vending machines falling on them than shark attacks. 
Vending machines? <laughs> vending machines. <laughs> I didn't even know vending machines fall on people. Oh, I've heard this. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a, that's shaking a fact. them to get well, the shit out. Yes. To get, they're trying to get the- Shut the fuck up. More that, people die from that than shark attacks. That's yeah, like that's, the soda out. Like it's stuck. And so they get on. They think it's a good idea to yeah. shake it. And then it falls right on them. And it's- So I actually watched this hundreds show of pounds. that talks what? about- What does that say there, Doug? <clears throat> so it's sound rather than sight or smell. Uh, so sound. your regular sounds like made by a swimmer in trouble- or a damaged fish. Don't uh, fart in the water, Justin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't flail about when no you're brown swimming. Sound. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Well, so I so I read I, I watched this show on irrational fears. It was really illuminating because of how as, as humans, how we where we place our fear. And they talked about so there was a cultural phenomenon that happened in the 1970s that shifted, completely shifted everybody's fears around going in the water. And it was Jaws. It was the movie yeah. Jaws. Yep. Before Jaws, shark attack, nobody talked about it. Nobody really cared. It wasn't that big of a deal. After Jaws, sharks was like the scariest thing ever. And they did these polls before and after Jaws. How, uh, you know, how afraid are you of, of shark attacks? How often do you think they happen? Before Jaws, it was like barely registered. After Jaws, everybody's like, oh my God. And then what happened because of the cultural phenomenon of Jaws, and anytime one happened, every, newspapers every. reported it. Everybody want to know about it. Yeah, so people got the skewed. Dude, this is how I feel about uh, news and media in general. Oh, like, totally. It's just like one isolated incident that they just, you know, now it's so easy to spread it worldwide that it looks like it's happening all over the place. But yeah, the, that's to that point. Um, it, it really doesn't happen often at all. And so I'm not like out here promoting like, oh no, the fear of shark attacks. Because even then they were attacked, but it's like they didn't eat them. Like they realized, oh, this isn't the food I was going for. Yeah, yeah. And then they escaped. Well, not just that. Think of all, how many surfers <clears throat> are in the water in that area. Swimmers and Every surfers. Every day. Yeah. Every it's not day. like that water is like, like nobody's ever in there. Yeah. Hell, that's like one of the most popular places in the world right. to surf. And you hear about shark attacks that are so rare. Right, so it's it's not a very common thing at all. You have to think that's what causes so much of the uh, anxiety that I feel like our society is plagued with right now. It's just because they, irrational. Yeah, so not totally irrational. You get you get you hear every every crazy thing you now hear about like on social media. If it's the crazier it is, the faster it goes viral, and the more it feels real and close well, to home, even though it couldn't be further from the people truth. don't realize that like kidnappings, kids getting kidnapped, like this mm -hmm. is the safest time ever in terms of kidnappings, but you wouldn't think that. But yeah. if you talk to parents, they think it's the scariest time. You know how much more likely it was to get kidnapped when we were kids? Oh, I know. Versus today? Oh, oh, totally. You didn't have any trackers or anything that you could then, you know, find my phone. Find Like, you have, I mean, they have great options now for kids with, like, watches yeah. and things. So you can at least, like, know proximity-wise. There was this there. comedian that did a whole bit on it. It was so funny. <laughs> He's like, kids were hotter back in the day. That's why I got kidnapped. Well, <laughs> this, dude, this, we were better-looking kids, dude. Yeah. <laughs> He's like kids. Are, he's like that's why they're not kidnapping kids anymore. I was like, oh my god, yeah, that's bro. what it is, dude. <laughs> that's hilarious. Anyway, so Adam, I want to ask you about this thing with the contact lenses with Felix Gray. Are they? Oh, they're, they're making a promotion, big, right? Yeah, they're making a big push on it right now. I think they have like some promotion. It's like five dollars for a month to for, try out their their company. Yeah, is that contact? what it is, Doug? Make sure you double check my. Yeah, that's what you told me earlier. Let me check. Yeah, make sure. I, I think I heard. So for that, five dollars, sure. you test out, and these are specifically super comfortable. They're, contacts that also I think uh, block out the blue light so they're not just con that's what really? we talked yeah we talked about it last time and I think that we were under the impression that they're they are just getting in the contact space and they're just regular contacts but they're designed to to protect from the blue light so they're wow. not just regular they're not just regular contacts they're contacts that are designed to also really? yeah protect from the, wow. the, the blue light so that's got to be one of the first ones I think it is. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think it is. I would be really neat is actually to talk to him and see how well it's doing and if it's taking off or not. Was it? Am I right, Doug? Is it? Uh, you are right. Okay. So it's five dollars for sixty lenses. Okay, mm. so it's daily, uh, yeah. daily use or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what does it say into the features or what's the deal there? Uh, well, it's what I mentioned last time. It's got the what they call an ultra thin optical center point, which helps improve visual acuity. Uh, so. They're more uh, water rich, so that they're you know more You'll comfortable to wear. Okay. Uh, fifty eight percent more water. So um, I mean, again, I don't know about the blue light I was blocking reading, aspects I of was them, but that. so I know. Yeah, I I read a, a either a review or on their website that it it's it's more than just contact lenses. But for, for five bucks for a month's supply, if you wear them, might as well try them. I've right? never had contacts. Is that a hell of a good deal or what? What's it? Oh, I would think so. Well, I mean, I don't. 
ever wear these kind of lenses, but if I did, I would try them out. Well, you're the only one that's actually wore any contacts, right? Is yeah, you? I've always worn hard lenses. And like at I night. said before, I wear them at night, so I take them out in the day, and they reshape the, the, the eye. So they're totally different. I wore contacts for a very short period of time because I, I, I did LASIK eye surgery years ago. I didn't know you did that. Oh, yeah. I did it like, uh, I want to say 14 years ago. And my eyes still- Did you I, used to wear glasses? I wore glasses when I would drive. And if I needed to look at something, like if I'm in a classroom to look kind of far away or whatever. Yeah. And then I tried contact lenses, hated them, hated putting them on and it was a pain in the ass. So I just have them here and there. And then when I started doing jujitsu a lot, um, I didn't want, I was like, uh, you know, I, I want my vision to be really good. Can't wear glasses while I'm doing jujitsu. I did the LASIK um, surgery, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the process. Yeah. It's a lot better now even. It's like in and out, same day. Yeah. Bro, it's like 30 seconds. One eye, the other eye, yeah. out in like two minutes. Yeah, it's crazy. It looks scary, like, but it's nothing. Well, right? I mean, I saw them peel part of my freaking Yeah, that's why I'm like, Ugh. It feels weird, but it's like you feel nothing. Mm. It was done. And in today, we're looking at, I'm like 13, 14 years later, my eyesight is still better than normal. So I know it's supposed to, over time, maybe you wear off a little bit, but- it's still phenomenal. Oh, do you sometimes have to redo it? Is yeah. That, oh, just because you get older and your eyes, you know, change a little bit. Mm. And, um, but, I mean, it won't help me with, like, my ability of my eyes to um, contract to look at things near. So, at some point, people tend to have to wear glasses for that as they get older. Did LASIK doesn't did help I, I think it was me who brought up that it, it was a myth that I thought was true was the um, – if you have light-colored eyes that you're more likely to uh, end up wearing glasses – yeah, yeah, I got so, debunked. I thought that was true. There was Did a myth that, that I've never heard that. There yeah. was a myth that the best snipers had uh, light blue or gray eyes. Mm. That was also a myth. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, that they're supposed to have the best vision and they could yeah shoot the furthest or whatever. Oh, see, I heard they were the worst vision. I heard that mm. like I heard the opposite that they, they, they're more likely to end up having to wear glasses by having and I can't remember what what it had something the way that the way the color eye filtered regular light it just put more strain on light colored eyes i think versus like a, a, a dark colored eye yeah i don't know no, i don't know either check this out you're not what you eat you're what you digest how you break food down is crucial in terms of getting nutrients to the tissues you want like muscles and helping you feel better not get bloated constipated diarrhea uh really digestion is one of the most important factors to consider when it comes to your diet and you can take digestive enzymes to really help this process. Now, there's only one company that we recommend when it comes to digestive enzymes, Masszymes. These are digestive enzymes for people interested in building muscle, burning body fat, and improving their health. Go check this company out. It's called masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash mind pump, and then use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off any order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Nick from Washington. Nick, what's happening? How can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, thanks. To, as everybody says, thanks for what you guys do. Thanks for all the content. I've been listening to the podcast now for uh, basically since the start of COVID. I found you guys. Um, I, uh, I have been training pretty much consistently for the last four years. I have been lifting for probably 24 years since I was a kid. Um, my primary goal is to try and stay as functionally strong as I can. Um, I, I love to occasionally lift heavy, um, but really wasn't for a long time until I kind of got into your guys' MAPS programs. I, I started uh, back into some more heavier lifting when I started the anabolic program. Um, I Before that, I was pretty much doing a, the, the kind of traditional total body, uh, routine, um, three days a week, total body, some kind of push, some kind of squat, some kind of pull, some kind of hip hinge, <clears throat> some kind of core work, and then some kind of accessory movement, biceps, triceps, whatever, whatever I felt like doing at that point. Um, over the last year, I started anabolic about a year ago and, uh, over the last year, so I went anabolic performance, I went back to anabolic, and now I'm on phase two of aesthetic. <clears throat> and excuse my voice, my son had a sinus infection, so I uh, have been recovering from that. Um, anyway, uh, in the last, the first phase of uh, aesthetic, I, I kind of have noticed this trend over the last few years. I was never a big deadlifter when I was younger, but um my, my deadlift has always traditionally been lower than my squat. So uh, during phase one, I dropped the rep range down to singles in the last uh, the last week of phase one for aesthetic and 
but I'd see what I could do. And once again, my, my single for squat was probably about 20 or 30 pounds heavier than my single for deadlift. Uh, my, I guess my first question, you know, as a physical therapist, I see a lot of patients who have a lot of weird abnormalities, a lot of, uh, a lot of differences from either side to side or front to back, but is having that level of, um, you know, asymmetry from front to back, is that abnormal? And then, uh, Second of all, if, if it's not abnormal, what can I do that wouldn't necessarily focus on just my deadlift uh, that would still help bring it up to where it's at, at least even with my squat, if not better than my squat? Yeah, it's so rare to meet anybody who has that where that's the case. You normally are, are better at one than the other. Yeah. It's pretty- it's called, well, so it's, it's, it's not abnormal, but it's not common. So what I mean by that is the fact that your squat is better than your deadlift it, it is definitely more common that someone can deadlift more than they can squat, but it's not abnormal in the sense that there's something this wrong with me. you. As I say, Justin. Yeah, squat. Justin's and like it, this. Yeah, and it was mainly because of the practice and the amount of time spent on the squat specifically. Never even did the deadlift except for a power clean version, which was a lot lighter. Um, but yeah, like that took me years after the fact to start kind of building up my, uh-huh. my deadlift strength. And it was just basically mastering the technique of it and getting my body acclimated to, you know, adding quite substantial more weight. But still today, you're still a bigger squatter than you are deadlifter, right? Yeah, still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. still. It's, I could, I could there's, there's like it. leverage stuff and, and body, different body shapes. So like, if you looked at like the top level, like the strongest deadlifters, especially deadlifters that are. Um, maybe not, not small. So taller, taller deadlifters tend to have long arms. They tend to have really long limbs, right? They also tend to not be very good at bench press because bench press requires, or a heavy I'm bench press. short arms. Well, there you go. I was just going <laughs> to yeah. say it. You probably have shorter arms. You have shorter limbs. And so you're, you're probably built better to press and squat than you may be to, to pull, right? Now, the only time I would say this is an issue is if your deadlifts cause you a lot of pain, and you have uh, issue, you know, issues with your low back or your hips or something like that. But if there's no pain, I wouldn't worry too much about the fact that your squat is heavier than the deadlift just because other, most people are the other way around. It's not that big of a deal. Now, your other question was, how can I, can I do things that will help me get better at the deadlift that aren't necessarily a deadlift? Well, yeah, of course you can. Um, usually squatting more will get you better a better deadlift. But if someone like you, I would recommend um, single leg deadlifts. Mm-hmm. Single leg deadlifts are really good. Unilateral work would be yeah, great. Yeah, and, and just unilateral work in general, I think would be really good for, for somebody like you. And then maybe something that would help work on rotation, maybe the QL a little bit, like like windmills. Uh, windmills might be pretty good for someone like yourself to see if you get that, that the, the QL and core stability really good. That could translate over to a better deadlift sometimes. But other than that, I, I wouldn't worry about the discrepancy in the weight too much. It's not a huge – it's not like you could squat 405 – but you can only deadlift 105. That'd be that'd be really strange. They're close enough in, no. in yeah, they're close yeah. enough in weight uh, to where again, although it's more common the other way around, it's not that big of a deal. It's not something you can worry about. And it's not it's not abnormal. It's just not common. I tend to toggle back and forth depending on like my goal, right? Uh, of what I tend to do more of in my programming based off of what I want, right? Mm-hmm. So. When I'm when I'm chasing increasing my deadlift, I'm deadlifting more frequently than I am squatting in my routine, and, and therefore I scale back a little bit on my squatting, and vice versa. When I'm really trying to move my squat, I just I, I scale back on the deadlifting a little bit, and I'm squatting more often. That that's a simple way to look at this too. Is just like if you are, let's say, front squatting and back squatting, and then deadlifting in a week. Maybe I do two rounds of dead deadlifting and one of squatting in the week. So depending on what your routine looks like. I, I normally will interchange and they're both they both have such tremendous carryover that you're, you're not going to like regress big time by by doing that you'll just probably get a little bit more emphasis on the one that you're doing more frequently and so uh, and I and I love to toggle back and forth I go on a kick for a while that it's like I really want to improve the squat so I'm just doing that a little more frequently and then other times when I really want to move the deadlift and I just do that more frequently yeah besides uh, unilateral work I know one thing that really helped me because of um, you know that initial a uh, bit from the beginning, doing a deficit deadlift really and focusing on, um, mm-hmm. you know, pulling from, from a lower position uh, really helped me dig more weight up from that initial pull. So that was, that was definitely a focus of mine that helped to improve the overall performance. 
Not something I've never done. That would be a really cool thing to try and work in. Yeah, give it a shot. Just go real light. Just light. Yes. Go real light when you start with that. It's compromising. That's an example. And if I, if you're gonna move, no, knowing kind of where I where I've started from as far as you guys' programs go, if I was gonna move from aesthetic into something that would kind of gear me in that direction, which one would you guys lean for? Symmetry. I like symmetry for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll send that to you, Nick. If you don't okay. have that, okay. I don't. That'd be great. Thank you guys so much. You got it, man. No problem. Thanks, Nick. Sweet. Thanks for calling in. Go Niners. Hey, thanks again for what you guys do. I uh, I have a three-year-old little boy, so I hear your guys' stories about your kids growing up, and it's uh, it's just been kind of fun, you know, to to hear your stories and to compare them to my own. And you know, mine's been a little physical therapy experiment to see how he develops, and to hear your guys go back and forth too. It's just been a ton of fun. <laughs> That's awesome, Thank you guys for awesome. what you do. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Right on. Why do you say go Niners? Because he's, he's wearing Seattle, Seattle, Seattle shirt. Seattle. Dude. I know. Oh, I see. You're, you're doing so well. I know. Hey, look, this is the shit that I don't care about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, you do you ask? You know so. what's you know what's interesting about this? So, so if you look at like top lifters, for example, if you look at the world's strongest squatters, they squat way more than they deadlift. If you look at the world's strongest deadlifters, they did lift way more than they squat. If you look at the world's strongest like overhead pressers. They overhead press more than they bench press. So this, this stuff gets kind of weird yeah. when you look at those top levels, not because necessarily they train a specific way, although that's part of it. The other part of it is sometimes your body is built yeah. 100%. in a Leverage, way that makes you better. Uh, that gives you advantages. Yeah, like I, I, deadlifting I, is way easier for me yeah. than squatting. Yeah, I, I'm definitely built to pull you guys, things. You guys crush me. Yeah, I can, I can row and pull and do pull-ups with significantly more weight than I can pressing or squatting just the way my body I squat built. I squatted longer than I deadlifted I was I've been squatting a lot longer than I deadlifted yeah. I barely got into deadlifting not that long ago and progressively quick just because it's it I have those, built more for yeah it. I'm built I'm built better for it so it's very normal for somebody to have one that they're stronger than the other but I mean it's I, usually the other way around though, but right? don't you guys just I mean this is how I this is I would just uh I Focus on one more than the other always in my routine. Sometimes I'm on a squat kick, and so my my routine <clears throat> yeah. looks a little more heavily around squats. Other times I'm on a deadlift kick, and I'm and it's just more. And then you you brought up things like deficit deads. So that's how my my frequency of deadlifting increases. But then one day is like the heavy hard training, and then other days I'm doing things like deficit yeah. deads or yeah. single leg deadlifts, like yeah. things that aren't as taxing as heavy heavy deadlifts. You can build volume and also it, like add some technique and yeah. Focus and on. and I always see a great movement in in that category when I when I focus like that. Our next caller is Mary Grace from New York. Hi, um, thanks Hi, for having me. I'm uh, super excited to be here and I'm super thankful for all the content you put out. Um, I have a question about osteoporosis and uh, weightlifting. I was diagnosed with osteoporosis about five years ago and um, my doctor uh, suggested that at my age I work on treating it through lifestyle rather than medication. Um, so that means for me, making sure that my body fat is um, high enough that I'm producing enough estrogen. And it also means weightlifting. Um, I was wondering if it would make more sense to focus on specific areas where I know my bones are weakest, or if I should just focus on full body exercises and um, benefit from you know, the systemic effects of weight bearing exercise. Yeah. If that makes sense. Good really, question. Yes, really good question. Yep. And, and so uh, five years ago, how old were you when you first got diagnosed? Because you uh, look young. Yeah, 30. 30 years old. Do you mind if I ask you, you don't have to answer this, but do you mind if I ask you a, a personal question? Sure. Have you struggled with uh, any disordered eating? Um, I definitely wasn't eating enough okay. in my 20s. Um, okay. And my weight was a lot lower than it is now. Was it diagnosed or is this just your, your self-diagnosis? Um, uh, in terms of like eating or yeah. in terms of, yeah, in, in, yeah, self-diagnosis. Okay. So the reason why I'm asking that, Mary, is typically when you find a young lady with bone loss, um, there's usually a dysfunctional or disordered eating connected to it, usually uh, anorexia. Um, yeah. and, and so this is the main cause of what's happening. Now the strength training is going to send a signal to build bone and muscle. Okay. Yeah. And to answer the, the, the question that you asked, 
you want to focus on full body exercises. That's going to give you the most bang for your buck. So deadlifts, squats, bench presses, rows, overhead presses. Mm -hmm. Now the, 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 the problem is, is if you don't feed yourself appropriately, the strength training is not going to do anything for you. So you're going to need to go on a bulk while you lift the weights. Now, if this sounds or feels challenging or triggering, or if you if you if you're like, oh, I don't want to gain any weight, and you know, again, you don't have to answer this on this, but it just within yourself, if what I'm saying makes you feel uncomfortable, like, oh man, I don't want to go on a bulk, like the, just the word bulk makes me feel uncomfortable. I suggest you work with somebody who's got uh, who's a who's an expert in this, so you could work with a therapist, work on your issues with food, and then work with the strength training in conjunction with that. Because the strength training won't help you otherwise. Otherwise, what you'll do is you'll just be sending a signal to your body, but your body's not going to have the building blocks to do so. It's not going to. It's not going to be able to do anything. Now, if you combine it with an increase in calories, so number one is going to be calories. You want to have your calories be higher than what they were at. Number two is going to be the essential macronutrients, proteins, and fats. Number three are going to be your essential micronutrients, in particular, vitamin D, magnesium, calcium, uh, vitamin K, and the like. So make sure you don't have any nutrient deficiencies. And then lastly, carbohydrates. But if you're hitting your calories, proteins, fats, and those micronutrients, and you're lifting weights two or three days a week, that's about all I would have you do, two or three days a week of, of weight training, you're going to see your bone loss reverse. You will, you will have uh, tremendous results. And the best way to gauge this is going to be strength. What you probably don't want to do is weigh yourself on the scale. In fact, what I would tell you to do, and I, this is likely what the person you work with is going to recommend you do, is to not weigh yourself at all, but rather just look at the weights that you can lift in the gym. If your strength is going up, then that's a great sign that you're getting enough to eat and that you're lifting weights in a, in a, in a way that's going to stimulate bone growth. It's going to stimulate strengthening of the bones. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that totally makes sense. Do you and have, I'm also go ahead. Super. Oh, I'm also super comfortable bulking and eating more. Um, 10 years ago, I might not have been, but now I just want to build strength. Well, you're, you're in a oh, great place. Wonderful. If you, if that, if that doesn't bother you and you're comfortable increasing your calories and going on a bulk following maps anabolic, which will give you, if you don't have, do you have maps anabolic by chance or no? No. Nope. Okay. We'll send that. We'll send that over to you. Uh, because that on a bulk and just literally following that program to a T and I think you're going to see oh my God, you'll tremendous get, results. You'll get incredible results, mm -hmm. but really take your mindset and wrap it around strength. Mm -hmm. If strength goes up, muscle and bone are going to get better. We're going to get stronger. That's what you want to think. So, so don't gauge it off anything else, but strength. Just use that as your primary metric to measure. Oh my God, I added 10 pounds to my squat. I know I'm going to get you know, bigger muscles and I know my bones, which my muscles anchor to, are going to get stronger and continue down that path. I've worked with several people in a similar situation to yours and the results we got, in fact, one lady was so, uh, the results were so remarkable that her doctor actually uh, turned into a case study because they wow. couldn't believe just how, and she was in her 60s. So she wasn't even young like you are. So I'm going to send you MAPS Anabolic, follow that program. And I would take your, whatever your caloric intake is now, and I would increase it by a pretty significant amount, you know, maybe by 700 calories or 800 calories or so, and then watch the weight in the gym. Uh, and if it goes up, you're doing the right thing. Mary, I'm going to have, I'm going to have Doug give you free access to our private forum too. I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to hear your progress as you go through this. And if you have any challenges along the way and, and, and mainly probably nutrition stuff, if you have questions along that, uh, as you're going through this. So I'll have Doug throw you in there too. Awesome. Thank you so much. You got it. Thank you so much for calling in. Thank you. Yeah, the whole um, hormone thing that she mentioned, like I need to get more fat on my body. So my estrogen, which is true, right? If your estrogen's too low, you can cause bone loss. But that's the that's a side effect, right, right? right? The side effect of just not eating enough. It's not the root of it. Yeah. Yeah. And when and again, when someone it's it, when it's a when it's somebody at this age, it's so 
because it's so rare. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost always because a person is depriving themselves yeah, nutritional of, deficiency of, of for, some sort. for years. Yeah. Well, it sounds like that's where she was, right? It sounds yeah. like she came from that place. Sounds like she's in a place where she, I mean, she would like no hesitation said, I have no problem bulking. Mm -hmm. Normally you can hear it in someone's voice. They're like, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> you know, and they're like, mm, okay. well, probably so been working through this if quite she's, a lot. It, yes. And if she's listening right now, what I would say to her is I would still work with someone and say, hey, look, here's a deal. I feel like I don't have any issues going in this direction, but I'd like to work with you maybe every other week, so twice a month, just in case I start to exhibit some well, of the Well, I mean, I know we're not therapists, but that's why I want her in the forum Yeah, for that example. I know you did. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, just so we can hear updates and, and how it's going and stuff like that, and hopefully we hear it's from like her. It's like a built-in support system. Yeah, hopefully we hear from her once a month or like that. Yeah, when you're know. around other women who are trying to get stronger, yes. it can be very, very encouraging. Our next caller is Dan from Canada. Dan, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Well, first of all, it's uh, Thanksgiving Day here in uh, Canada. And right. uh, so happy Thanksgiving. And uh, it's, I'm giving thanks for to, to have this opportunity to chat with you guys. So uh, I'm going to be 64 this year. A little bit of background. Uh, actually, 64 in about four days. And uh, I've been a lifelong musician, uh, mainly as a sideman. But in the last... 10 years ago, I decided to try and do a solo career. And so it was basically, I knew I had to make, you know, some changes. So uh, lifestyle. So I started working out consistently, doing tons of cardio, low calorie diet, intermittent fasting for longevity benefits. And then I discovered mind pump and uh, realized I was doing everything wrong. <laughs> so uh, I realized that, uh, you know, I, I learned so much through your podcast and Sal's book. I bought the RGB bundle and several other bundles in the past three years, and I've been consistently following and tracking MAPS Anabolic and Aesthetic. Uh, lifting has really become a second passion for me, uh, and I appreciate the, like, the benefits as I age. So I've continued to practice and improve my technique getting deeper in my squats and better range of motion as you guys are always preaching and you know that provides a level of satisfaction but i'm wondering if i should be using metrics other than strength and muscle gain to measure my progress and why i'm asking is i've checked out other podcasts that are geared towards my demographic but they're usually hosted by guys who have lifted forever and i've only started you know so they look they don't re, you know they don't resemble me or my history so where i only started three years ago i'm wondering um how realistic is strength and muscle gain and over the past two years whenever i attempt to like bulk lean bulk really tracking my macros accurately the weight i gain seems to be like mainly fat as then when i do try and do a cut I returned to like my previous body measurements and similar lift results. So I should say that because I was about 40 pounds overweight when I started this journey, I know that I do get a little reluctant to eat in a calorie surplus for a long period of time when I see the scale go up by more than 10 pounds. So I know you guys are probably going to say that's probably the issue as well. But now shut up and uh, ask for your advice. You look you look great, bro. By yeah. the way, yeah, you look phenomenal. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to keep up with my my band is 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 all twenty to twenty five years younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dan. Um, for 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 most adults, uh, it, consistent strength training the the results happen very quickly in the first year. After the first year, it really does tend to slow down, and after year three it slows down significantly, okay? And this is for any adult male. Now, at your age, it's probably a little bit, it's probably gonna happen a little faster because you start to, once you get to 70, um, then what you're doing, you're, you're kind of fighting the decline is what you're doing with strength training. Right. And, and it really, and you already know this, um, you don't wanna compare yourself to people or to yourself in your 20s. Look at yourself in comparison to other people in your age group your light years more fit, probably more more mobile, and have better energy than most sixty four year olds do. So that's that's really the only fair comparison. Um, as far as bulk is concerned, I would bulk, and I would use health and energy as the metric with the bulk, not necessarily weight on the scale, and maybe not even necessarily too much weight on the bar. Right. You will see the weight go up on the bar, but at some point, pushing strength and just size. You start to take away from things like health, longevity, and energy. So bulking mm -hmm. is okay, but use kind of energy and how you feel. When you start to feel bogged down 
When you start to feel like, oh, I'm kind of stuffed or my digestion's off, then reverse out of it. That's what that's how I would treat the bulk. So it's probably going to be a short bulk. You're probably going to bulk for three yeah. weeks or four weeks at a time. And then okay, cool. And then go back to maintenance versus like a 12 week bulk. That's where you're pushing. That's exactly what I was going to suggest yeah. is like our, our mini cuts, mini bulk. So you're never going to be in a calorie surplus longer than a couple of weeks. And then you go right back to your deficit, back to a surplus, really? back to a deficit. So you're spending a little more time in the surplus than you are deficit, but you're going right back. And, and, and again, like to Sal's point, I mean, I think you look phenomenal or doing killer right now, dude. I, I think that if you maintaining the way you look and feel and if, and if we are or feeling good in the morning and your joints are feeling good i mean I, I to me that's the most important thing uh where you at does that mean you can't build more muscle at your age absolutely you can but i i think the the longevity staying healthy feeling good that, yeah. that stuff matters so much more uh especially with what you're what you're trying to do it's about performance right and feeling feeling good while you're probably yeah. on stage for hours right so uh, yeah, that's the stuff that I would be asking feedback. So to me, if you were my client and and you just did, a, you know, you just got done with a set and I'm like, how'd you feel afterwards? Like, I care more about that than going like, hey, did we hit our bench max last week? Yeah. Like, yeah. I want to hear that you you got to crush the thing that you love and you felt great doing it. That means however we're training and dieting, I'm, I'm, ho I'm honing in on that. So that's, to me, that's the greatest feedback. Yeah. Cool, man. Because that—that's I—I I do feel fantastic. You know, my my. I guess my point was like I was wondering about should I continue to even bulk? Should I just look at maintaining? I was thinking about you, Adam. Actually, when you were you had talked about how you used to you know use that five pounds up, five pounds down when you were you know going through uh, uh, and not worry about like bulking a whole bunch, but just you know you, where you changed your whole physique kind yeah. of thing with that. And so my, yeah, my question was really like, you know, should I just look at maintaining or, you know, sounds like I'd love to try that approach because what happens to me is I, I gain and then I kind of get nervous. I'm like, oh man, I just, I don't feel right. So yeah. that's, that's, that's perfect advice, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Just, just go for short bulks. And then when you start to yeah. feel like ah, I'm done with it, then, then back out of it. So it'll probably be like two to four weeks at the most. That's probably what you're looking Dan, at. Dan, do you yeah, have undulated. do you have Maps Prime or Prime Pro? Either one of those? I got both of them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to try. I was going to try and really give gotta, you. I was trying to give you, know, you something. I I I, I got to you know focus more on that because I I understand totally. You know that's what I want to be able to re, you know maintain my mobility and flexibility for sure. Yeah. No, you awesome. got you're, you're good, man. You're set. You doing a lot of guitar whips and, and, and jump hacks on stage or what? Man? You know, man, I can't. I probably can't keep up with you. I'm sure. But, uh, yeah. No, I'm I like, try. Wow. Yeah, you already look yeah. great, man. I'm just yeah, wondering like you know, well, what more can we do? I, I so appreciate you guys so much. Like I was, I was saying that you know my whole lifestyle and approach to fitness. You know, I know everybody says this to you, but. It's it's been your approach. I've got sales book, and it's like my whole approach has been because of you guys. So uh, thanks so much. You got it. Appreciate awesome, the support, Thank you so much. All righty. Thanks, guys. You got it. Thanks. Yeah, you know this brings up a good point. I love talking to people like that. So do I. Yeah. This really brings up a good point where and we preach a lot about you know building muscle and getting strong and how important that is, but at some point. You don't focus on that anymore. You, don't, you can only go so far. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look at us, right? We've been working out for so long. I mean, I could push and try, and I'm not going to gain that much more muscle, you know, anymore. It's yeah. just, and, and if I keep pushing in that direction, I start to sacrifice quality of life and health. And so, at some point, it just becomes feeling good, and it and it's a back and forth thing. Like I gain a little bit, I lose a little bit, and mm -hmm. a little bit more ability and, and more strength, and maybe a little bit more stamina. And just because you're enjoying the process, that's really what the focus at that point. You know, well, especially, I mean, dude looks like he was 30. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he looks Here great. He looks great. I, I think he's just, you know, he's on, he's out in public a lot more. He's going to be sure. like on display and he's around yeah. a bunch of young people. And so it's like, you know, he's in his head a bit, right? Yeah, he's yeah. already looks awesome. It's like, you know, what can I do to, to maybe add a little bit more? Uh, you know, it's my physique. Yeah. So I, I get that. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's the, again, going back to what I said to him is that uh, the feedback I'm wanting to hear is that is like, I, I care more about 
you know, touching bases with him on a, a biweekly basis and going, hey, how did we sleep last week? Yeah, how was yeah, exactly. how was your, you know, your guitar practice? How was the concert? Like, and you tell me, oh man, Adam, I felt good and I felt mm -hmm. he slept well and I kicked ass out. Like, okay. Versus you going like, oh, you know, my bench press, it dropped back like, you yeah. know, 15, 20 pounds. I don't give a shit. You yeah, know what exactly. I'm saying? Like where, he, where he's at, like just feeling good. And, and now that being said, if somebody's watching right now in their 60s and they're starting strength training and oh. they're wondering, can I build muscle and strength? You yes. definitely can. Significant muscle and strength. It just slows down after a few years. That's all. Our next caller is Dan from London. Dan, what's happening? How can we help you? Uh, hi, guys. Nice to be here. Um, I'm calling about resistance bands. Um, I'm a trainer. I've been a uh, personal trainer certified for a year now. So still early on my journey. And thanks to all you guys for all your help and your programs as well. They've really been massive value to me just early on in this process. And I'm loving it. And what I train, well, who I train in particular is dads in middle age, many of whom haven't got experience of training before and they often have no equipment they don't have access to a gym and what i like to do is to get them working with body weight and then into resistance bands to introduce them to resistance exercise now what i find is that this may be my experience as a trainer but i find that I want to get them into heavier stuff. I want to get them into different types of exercise with dumbbells, kettlebells, but I find that there's a sort of a cost problem sometimes with that, that they don't want to get invest in more equipment. And whether resistance bands in themselves can be the sole form of resistance training, whether I'm doing justice to the program that I'm creating by sticking with that or whether uh, it's it's too limited. Is there enough scope for development using resistance bands? Yeah, Good I mean question. there is. Yeah, especially if you combine it with uh, body weight exercises and or suspension trainer. So if, if if somebody's looking for minimal equipment, bands, suspension trainer, and body weight, you could go really far with that. Now you're not going to get like a max squat or a deadlift with those because mm. you can't really squat or deadlift with those, and, and strength is relatively specific. But can you build good muscle, strength, function using just what I said? Abs absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. And I've, I look, I, I used to manage a gym. My grand opened a gym once. And before we opened the weight area, we opened the cardio area and we sold memberships. And all my trainers were freaking out. How are we going to train clients? And all they did were bands. They only used bands. Mm. It, was like, it was like six months or four months of just band work. And the clients liked it so much and the trainers liked it so much that a lot of them stuck with mo mainly bands and body weight. So there's a lot you could do with those things. So, no, you're not limited. You'd be limited if you're talking about more like hardcore bodybuilding or powerlifting or strength specific type stuff. But otherwise, you're totally fine. Yeah. And you can manipulate, uh, you know, the other variables like rest, tempo, and like have some more isometric components in there. So you can add in some other ways of increasing strength demand and, and give them a little bit of a novelty. Um, so that way you can kind of interrupt what you've been doing with them with, with resistance bands and with just body weight, uh, ex explicitly. So, um, but yeah, eventually at, at some point, maybe they will want to do more. And at that point you can introduce them into, uh, you know, weight training with dumbbells or kettlebells and eventually barbells. But, um, I think you can do a whole lot, uh, for quite some time with that limitation. So, um, you know, you just got to get a little more creative is all. I, I mean, I love Sal's idea too. I mean, as a trainer, if you don't have this already, I mean, I would definitely grab a suspension trainer. That's such a great yeah. tool to progress these clients. I mean, I'm always, and I remember this exact challenge, but I totally remember getting clients like this and I'm like, damn, because I, I actually went to clients' houses and trained them for a while too. And, you know, I'd have these clients that had like nothing and all I had, all I had was really bands were going. And it, it, It'll do the job, absolutely. But I always want to encourage them to want to progress to a place where we eventually get the dumbbells and barbells. But the reality is some people just won't or some people can't afford it, so that's understandable. So the suspension trainer ended up being like just a godsend for me. I mean, that was something that I used all the time because you can make that you can make a, it real hard, real challenging, and it does a really good job of regressing it. So like when you have someone in the middle, it's like like uh, it's real easy to tell you like, oh, well, you can progress a client to a single leg uh, pistol squat, and that's really hard, and you'll build some muscle. 
to doing that. But like how many middle-aged dads who, you know, just got good at body weight lunges are going to be able to do a pistol squat mm. with good form and not, you know, blowing their knees out, right? So, but having a suspension trainer, I can regress that, right? I can back it up to where they, they're using that and I make it where they get a lot of assistance and then I make it a little more challenging, a little more challenging until eventually they are doing a single leg squat, which I guarantee you it will build some serious muscle uh, doing that. So, yeah, I, I think the suspension trainer would be a, a nice tool for you to to keep in addition to the bands. And then, of course, we're always trying to encourage our clients to, to get to barbell and dumbbell. I used to run into this a lot too, training people at their house. And, and so I used to carry with me uh, like at least three different types of kettlebells. So that way, at least I had one that they could press, one that they could pull, and then one that was more specifically for squatting and deadlifting. Uh, so, you know, at least I had that as an option to then kind of introduce it to them and start getting them a little bit of work that way. But that's obviously an investment on your part. Uh, you know, bringing that in. Yeah. You know, Dan, here's yeah. a, here's a little trainer secret. You, you started, you've been, you became a trainer a year ago. Yeah, that's right. All right. One of the most, I mean, when I learned this and I figured this out, it really made me a, a wizard with clients. And that was that. Training with no pants on? Well, yeah, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Works every time. That's, that's why Adam got fired. Let's re resign them all. Yeah. That way. Resign them all. No, um, no, really, when I wanted somebody to do something and they were reluctant, um, I would wait and then they would eventually want to do it. You know, Justin kind of hinted at that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, I want a client to use weights. And they say, no, I don't want to use the weights. I just want to use bands. Okay, no problem. And I would just train them with bands. And then eventually, nine out of 10 times, get them addicted. They would be like, hey, can mm. we try some dumbbell exercises? You know, or a client says, I only want to work out one day a week. No problem. One day a week. Let's just do that. Knowing that if they were consistent and they showed up and I trained them and they enjoyed it, eventually they'd want to work out more than once a week. So that's a little trainer secret. So what'll probably happen. Yeah is you tell your clients, because what you don't want to do, the opposite is this, or the other side of, of the coin is this. You don't want to make your client feel like they're wasting their time just because they're not using barbells and dumbbells. That's right. a big mistake. Mm -hmm. So a big mistake a lot of trainers make is they, they make the case so hard for a piece of equipment or for a gym access that then the client feels like, well, why am I doing this? If I, if I can't do what he just said, because he said it's so awesome, then what I'm doing is really just at best second fiddle. So I don't even want to do this anymore. So you don't want to make the case so hard that you set yourself up that way. So instead I don't want to use dumbbells and barbells. No problem. We'll just use body weight and bands. Then don't, that's it. Don't say anything else. Train them long enough, have fun, let them see results, make it consistent or keep them consistent. And eventually I swear to God, 90% of them will say, you know what? I want to use uh, dumbbells and barbells. And then you'll go right back, right to where you wanted to in the first place. Do you know what? That's interesting because I think some of my uh, worries come from the fact that personally, I love to go to the gym and train with the heavy stuff, the barbells, and the dumbbells. So there's a bit of me that feels uh, hypocritical or uh, uh, or misleading by saying that they can continue, even though I feel like it's great for them because they're relatively early in the journey. I just lack that sort of knowledge. Having not done it for myself uh, for a long period of time, training with resistance bands only that I can say for sure you should, you should do this. You see? Yeah. Look mm -hmm. here. The, 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 the comparison you're making is wrong. The comparison is what you're doing with them versus what they were doing before is what mm. you're doing with them better than what they were doing before. Sure. Of course. Yeah, Absolutely. Better. Well, there you go. You're done. That's it. So don't, don't look yeah, okay. at perfect. Don't worry about that. What they're doing now is so much better than what they were doing before. So when they say, Hey, I only want to use bands. No problem. I can work with that. You want you don't yeah. want to give them any inkling a of a feeling. Step forward. You don't want them to feel at all like they're doing a subpar, you know, decision. Just oh yeah, no yeah, no problem. Okay. We could totally work with that. No big deal. Dan, do you own do you own a map suspension yet? I do not actually. No, I'm gonna have Doug yeah, send that to you. That. Yeah, and then you just get a suspension oh, trainer. Okay. So. Yeah, we'll send that over to you, and then uh, you know, if you don't have one already, I, I invest in that. Um, and I think that's a great tool for a trainer to have uh, to progress these clients. So take totally. a look at that and take the programming out of there. You'll like it. Yep. Ah, oh, excellent. Thank you. No problem. Hey, when are you guys gonna do a resistance band one? Well, we've, we've talked uh, about this actually. <laughs> a pure resistance this. band one, uh, no, but Maps it. anywhere has uh, body weight resistance. Got the bones band. of it, but yeah, uh, yeah we'll see yeah, yeah. some someday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys are brilliant. Thanks a lot for your help. All right, Dan. Thanks, thank Dan. you. Do you guys do you guys remember figuring that out as a trainer? Where instead of like selling them so hard on doing something they don't want, you just be like, yeah, we'll do that, knowing that 
eventually they're going to want. It was to a long anyway. time though. Oh yeah, it that. took a while, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a long time. It was, it was a it was a long time. That was most of my in home clients. I mean, I had yeah. a similar situation as that, and I would get so bored eventually that um, I would start bringing one new thing in and just to introduce it, and then they would want to invest and buy it themselves and keep it there. And I was like, oh okay. Yeah. Did you get so, affiliate codes with uh, the equipment company? <laughs> I should have. I should have. I, I, I think the, the, the hardest part is the um the the creative thinking uh, for the trainer on the lower body. Stuff. Totally, that's yeah. where it gets totally. Like, I think that's yeah. Where upper you, body is a lot yeah, more options. Lower, lower yeah, I think that's real, and tough. you can get an incredible workout upper body with with bands. I think you know just it, and you can you can also with lower body. It just takes a little bit more creativity to do things like deadlifts and you're doing Bulgarian split squats exactly. and. Uh, so stuff like that, I think, is what gets challenging for trainers. Totally. Look, if you like the show, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our free resources. We put a lot of stuff together that can help people with almost any health or fitness goal. And again, it's all free. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.